Okay, so let's switch to endocrine and pharmacology. Normally, hypothalamus release corticotropin releasing hormone. It stimulates anterior pituitary to release ACTH, and this ACTH stimulates adrenal gland to release various steroids. One of them is hydrocortisone. Now, if you're giving patient exogenous steroids like prednisolone, right, this will create a negative feedback in the HPA axis, the hypothalamopituitary adrenal axis. Now, and, and as a result, there'll be decreased production of endogenous steroid. This is a sort of negative feedback. Now, the problem is if you suddenly withdraw this prednisolone, there'll be no more hydrocortisone to serve the need in the body. This will be called acute adrenal insufficiency. And that's why it is advised to taper the dose of steroid so to prevent the acute adrenal insufficiency, right? So any patient uh, receiving greater than 5 mg of prednisolone will have uh, adrenal suppression. And we know the receptors of steroids are located inside the cell. Next drug is octreotide. Octreotide is a somatostatin analog. You remember we talked about somatostatin which was released by Delta cell from the island of Langerhans and it is universal inhibitor. It can inhibit every sort of secretion. So octreotide drug which is somatostatin analog which it can be used in secretory diarrheas, esophageal varices, malignancies, acromegaly, TSH secreting adenoma and odors of sulfur and urea, everything has somewhere in its where the secretion are increased. So octreotide can be used to decrease the secretion and mind well, it is inactive orally. So the question is, it is false, active orally is false, it is inactive orally. Now let's quickly review about how insulin is released and how glucose is taken up by the cells, especially the muscle cell. Now let's suppose you have increased glucose in your circulation. It will stimulate the beta cells of pancreas and there will be intracellular signaling mechanism which will increase the ATP inside the beta cell. Now this increased ATP will close the ATP sensitive potassium channel. These are the ATP sensitive potassium channel, right? You look this ATP sits here and closes this potassium channel so there'll be more potassium inside this will create a sort of depolarization in the beta cell and this will drive calcium inside this calcium will release the insulin out of beta cell now this insulin goes to the muscle and allows the glucose uptake now drugs like sulfonylureas and meglinitide right blocks this potassium channel so there'll be more potassium inside and again there'll be more depolarization, more calcium coming in and there'll be insulin release. These are the oral hypoglycemic drugs, sulfonylureas and meglinitides. And other drugs like metformin which is a bigonide, metformin, decreases the peripheral resistance of insulin, right? So this insulin can work very well in the periphery and it allows the glucose uptake. So metformin is decreasing the peripheral resistance and sulfur and ureas are acting on the beta cells. Now this is the approach how you will treat the diabetes mellitus patient. If you diagnose a patient having diabetes mellitus type 2, please send him for liver function and renal function test. If both of them are okay, start the patient with metformin, right? It is the drug of choice for diabetes mellitus type 2. If liver function test fails to be normal, you have to give him plain insulin or if the kidney function are not okay you have to give him sulfonylureas or thiazolidine ions right so which of the following statement about biguanides is not true you have to check about renal function test also all the following statement about meglinitide are true except it acts by decreasing insulin resistance was that true meglinitide acts on beta cell and it releases insulin more the drug which decreases peripheral resistance was metformin which is a bigonide. We discuss about the thyroid hormone synthesis and physiology and in this picture we will be looking at drugs acting on thyroid hormone synthesis. If you give patient excessive amount of iodine in form of potassium iodide, it will inhibit the iodine trapper and ultimately there will be decreased synthesis of T3 and T4. So there will be inhibition of the iodine trapper with the excessive amount of potassium iodide. This is called wolf shaikov effect. wolf shaikov effect, right? The next drug which inhibit thyroid peroxidase, these are 
प्रोपाइल थायोयूरेसिल कार्बीमाजोल एंड मिथिमाजोल राइट विच इनहिबिट्स थायरॉयड परॉक्सीडेज नाउ देर आर सर्टेन ड्रग्स विच ऑल्सो इनहिबिट द कन्वर्जन ऑफ टी फोर टू टी थ्री लाइक प्रोप्रेनोलॉल प्रोप्रेनोलॉल प्रोपाइल थायूरेसिल एंड वन ऑफ द एंटी एरिमिक ड्रग दैट इज एम्योडेरॉन राइट दिज ऑल इनहिबिट टी फोर टू टी थ्री कन्वर्जन बट माइंड वेल मिथिमाजोल डज नॉट इनहिबिट द कन्वर्जन ऑफ टी फोर टू टी थ्री सो इट्स ब्लॉक बाई ऑल एक्सेप्ट मिथिमाजोल डज नॉट ब्लॉक द कन्वर्जन विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज रॉन्ग रिगार्डिंग ट्रीटमेंट विथ आयोडीन दे मीन बाई पोटेशियम आयोडाइड एंड पोटेशियम आयोडाइड डिक्रीज द सिक्रीशन ऑफ टी थ्री एंड टी फोर एंड कैन बी यूज इन हाइपोथायरोडिज्म राइट इट इज नॉट कॉन्ट्रा इंडिकेटेड विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग एंटी ट्यूबरकुलर ड्रग इज एसोसिएटेड विद हाइपोथायरोडिज्म इथियोनोमाइड इज वन ऑफ द एंटी ट्यूबरकुलर ड्रग एंड दिस ऑल्सो इंटरफियर्स विद थायरोड हारमोन सिंथेसिस एंड कॉज हाइपोथायरोडिज्म इथियोनोमाइड 